Hello, my name is Jason Aldred. I'm a board certified neurologist, and fellowship trained in youth disorders. And uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, coming to you here from Spokane, Washington, uh, from my practice, Selkirk Neurology, uh, which is a medical practice here in Spokane, Washington, uh, where I focus on movement disorders with my clinical team, and also Inland Northwest Research, which is our clinical trials group. Uh, where we perform uh, movement disorder clinical trials, phase one, two, three, uh, on uh, movement disorders and, and Parkinson's. Uh, so uh, today I'm uh, speaking with you about deep brain stimulation. I'm happy to talk about an update for 2022. Uh, this uh, presentation is going to have two parts. The first part is uh, background of Parkinson's disease, so everyone's on the same page. And uh, the second half of the presentation, we'll go into some detail on uh, new developments in DBS, uh, some uh, uh, of those which are currently available, and also uh, looking at new advances that will soon be available uh, for deep brain stimulation. First of all, Parkinson's disease is a very common disorder, one of the most common neurodegenerative disorders. There's over a million people living with Parkinson's in America, and it's rapidly growing. What we see with Parkinson's is gradual progression and slow movement, stiffness and tremor, uh, severe disability and quality of life result from this. Uh, early on, there's a good response to medication, but the problem with Parkinson's is this really tremendously great response to medicine over, uh, over time because it becomes less long acting, uh, less consistent, less reliable. Uh, levodopa, which is one of our main med medications used to treat Parkinson's, for example, it always helps Parkinson's symptoms from the beginning of Parkinson's until uh, you know, someone dies from Parkinson's. They're, all, they're always benefiting to some degree from, from levodopa, but <clears throat> the, the, the degree of benefit from that and other medications for Parkinson's is just not as robust and strong and meaningful as uh, Parkinson's progresses. That, that's one of our big problems. And that's due to the progression of Parkinson's. Simply the, the condition progresses, there's more degeneration in nerve cells that uh, make dopamine in the process and it becomes uh, much less reliable. So this is important. Understanding the medication effects and how the medication works in Parkinson's is extremely important, it's crucial to understand how and why uh, deep brain stimulation, DBS, uh, is effective. And even um, uh, it, the medication response of Parkinson's is very informative uh, for uh, doctors to know how to use DBS, what the location to implant DBS, for example, which we're talking about. Again, the many symptoms of Parkinson's, these are movement symptoms, tremor, Masked face, stoop posture, arms flexed, the elbows and wrists, rigidity, tremor, shuffling steps. These are the hallmarks of Parkinson's disease. The feature of Parkinson's is pretty typical as well, is that it's a slow progressing condition. It doesn't progress rapidly. People don't develop Parkinson's disease and die in a few years. That's, if that happens, it's not from Parkinson's disease. It's some mimic of Parkinson's or something else happening. So that's not typical. Uh, the, the rule is uh, slow progression. Uh, symptoms typically affect one side more than the other. And also one of the key aspects to, to really confirming a diagnosis of Parkinson's is a, a meaningful response to levodopa. Um, there's some caveats there. Uh, for example, there are certain cases, you know, that 10% of people with Parkinson's will have an improvement in slowness and stiffness, but the tremor may not be that. It doesn't mean the medicine's not working, but uh, that that is, you know, we see that in as uh, Parkinson's doctors are trained to know that, that they that doesn't mean that they're they have Parkinson's. They may have a form of Parkinson's in which the tremor is kind of uh, difficult to control even with levodopa, but they do have Parkinson's and they'll progress as you would expect with Parkinson's. So these are the motor symptoms. These are improved by deep brain stimulation. There are symptoms that are improved by levodopa. And symptoms that are improved by levodopa are the ones we would expect to be improved by deep brain stimulation. Uh, there are other features of Parkinson's. We call them non-motor symptoms and 
they affect a variety of different aspects of the nervous system, cognition, memory, hallucinations, vision, lightheadedness, mood, sexual function, urinary function, constipation, dream, sleep. Uh, it's important to understand that these are symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and these are not improved by deep brain stimulation. When we're talking about deep brain stimulation and the goals of EDS. We should be clear about what are goals that we can achieve, which are treating the lupid symptoms, and which aspects of Parkinson's DPS does not help, but yet we can still treat uh, with other approaches, medications, other, other treatment options. Uh, I'm just so fond of this Parkinson's iceberg, I can't bear to not put it in a presentation. And uh, those of you who have been to Parkinson's education events before have seen versions of this. But just the idea that Parkinson's is a complex condition, uh, the Lewy bodies that are in the substantia nigrin Parkinson's uh, affect the movement symptoms, so that uh, these same Lewy bodies, these abnormal uh, structures that occur in dopamine cells that affect movement, they're also in many, many, many other cells in the body, in the GI tract, in the, the heart, salivary glands, uh, different parts of the brain. So, you know, it's a uh, uh, it's a very multifaceted condition. Uh, this is a, a single slide just reviewing that there are many medication options to treat the movement symptoms of Parkinson's. Uh, levodopa uh, is turned into dopamine in the brain. Uh, dopamine agonists or levodopa lookalikes, those are a pinerol, paraplexol, reticulin patch, and uh, a lot of different medications that uh, make the levodopa uh, uh, last longer, work better. Um, and uh, basically uh, not require as high dose of levodopa. Um, it wouldn't be a Parkinson's uh, movement sort of presentation if there weren't videos. <clears throat> this is a very old video I've used over and over again that demonstrates the off-state Parkinson's. Now, this is not what you see in early Parkinson's. This, is, by definition, defines more advanced Parkinson's or moderate Parkinson's, where a person, um, you know, really needs uh, needs uh, basically um, higher doses of levodopa than in a shirt. There is always like that. Uh, that needs higher doses of dopamine than their brain can make, and uh, when they don't get it, they slow it. Again, so remember, tremor, slowness, stiffness. Tremor is just one of the three symptoms of Parkinson's. Not everybody has it. Um, this gentleman here, for example, uh, doesn't have tremor. Uh, we call that akinetic Parkinson's. It just means a form with uh, out tremor. Shuffling, stiffness, uh, decreased arm swing. And this is a... a <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, this is our program in Spokane. 
the UBS program would do on-off testing to get with everybody. And this is you know, pretty, pretty typical. Okay, so again, just to drive the point home, Parkinson state versus the normal state. I guess you have on and off Parkinson state out of the way, but the idea is slowness, stiffness, tremor in the odd state, good movement, and the meds are working. Sometimes a little excessive, and that's called this change. We'll look at that here next. Okay. Uh, this means abnormal, kinesia means uh, the brain uh, loves or really needs to have dopamine stimulation on demand. Uh, the problem is that as we give people uh, levodopa, that's a Parkinson's medication, and uh, they uh, uh, respond to it, the brain, you know, really, it, it needs that. It, it's not able to make enough dopamine for itself, so it becomes, you know, really reliant on seeing what we give, we give it in order to function well. So become sensitive to dopamine and uh, uh, supply, uh, supplied by medication. And when it does that, uh, the sensitivity manifests in this. This is again, a, a very dramatic case of this condition. So this is not what you all out in the audience. This man has prominent coriform movements of the proximal and distal limbs, head, face, and trunk. So you've been on cinnamon for about eight years. But but it drives some point. This fella, I mean, without one more time, it's okay. Just the one. First, so it's not moving well. Okay. Have, have a Here's seat. a really interesting uh, view of it where he's on later on when he has deep brain stimulation. He's on uh, stimulation and on this, although I tell you a lower dose of medication. Next to your nose. We have here the stimulation. Okay, hold your arms in again. Tap to yeah. the right finger, not the left finger. So that, that allows okay. a much more okay. better walk response. His dyskinesia is eliminated with bilateral subthalamic okay. nucleus okay. stimulation. So what is deep brain stimulation? We've been talking about it a little bit already. <clears throat> uh, well, a, a battery is implanted uh, underneath the uh, collarbone area under the skin. Uh, you see here on the right side, the, the human form with the wire uh, going uh, beneath the skin, the implants beneath the skin, and a thin wire uh, is inserted uh, into the brain. Hole is drilled in the skull and uh, wire is put into the brain and it's not all self-contained. It's a neurosurgical procedure that improves Parkinson's symptoms when medicines can't do it alone. That's basically it. <laughs> this, is, this is a picture here of uh, the leads on the left side. Uh, you'll see that there's circumferential leads and then fragmented leads as well. This, this one on the lower, the lead in the lower section is uh, what a, a newer version of EBS leads look like called directional uh, stimulation. Okay, so what is helped by DBS? Uh, there's slow movement, stiffness, tremor, walking, slowing, slowly dyskinesia. That's helped by DBS. Um, what patients are DBS candidates? Well, uh, people that have a short period of good medicine response, but the medicines wear off. Uh, walking, use of hands, getting up from a chair slower. Uh, this case is present and bothersome. Uh, the tremor is present and bothersome and resistant to medication, or the medicine is taken frequently throughout the day and hard to take on time. Or uh, a more unique aspect is that there's medicine side effects such as nausea or low blood pressure symptoms from taking Parkinson's meds. And this is <clears throat> what, what the, the course of Parkinson's looks like over time. Again, you're having it on and off early in Parkinson's, levodopa is taken infrequently uh, here. Uh, and then with more moderate Parkinson's, it's taken more frequently. And advanced Parkinson's, even more frequently. You see the big difference here in advanced Parkinson's compared to moderate Parkinson's. Despite taking the medicine more frequently, there's less on time. See here, this is a dose that's taken, and, and there's no on time as a result. 
uh, which is a dose failure is a problem. And we see that for a variety of reasons in Parkinson's disease as it advances. But the bottom line is that the medicine still works. You still get on time, but it's not consistent. That's, that's key to understanding uh, what type of person is a, a great, uh, going to be a great responder to PBS. For Parkinson's disease, it's all about the right patient at the right time. It's the same we've had around the field for quite a long time. Um, you don't want to do DVS too early. Uh, it's, it's entirely possible someone's diagnosed in their, you know, mid to late 70s and they'll take medications for many, many years and live their life and, and you know, die and not ever really progress to the point where they need. So they, you know, they have a good quality of life without having to do this. Um, however, uh, particularly the flip side of that would be maybe you have your onset patients who end up living a long, long time with Parkinson's disease, many decades in cases. <clears throat> and, uh, and they, you know, are going to benefit from it as Parkinson's progresses. What, uh, so, so again, you don't want to do surgery too early because the medicines may work for many years or decade or more. But the longer you live with Parkinson's, you're absolutely going to develop these very effects. It, it, it's inevitable. If it's Parkinson's, it's inevitable. Um, the problem runs we run into for some patients is, uh, you know, they're understandably concerned about having a neurosurgical procedure or the medicine's working well, and they can kind of tell that, and they, you know, want to get the, the best benefit from medicine as long as they can. So they'll, they'll delay the deep brain stimulation, and that's very reasonable. Um, however, uh, the problem is that if, uh, you know, the, they're working with a, ideally the Parkinson's doctor or clinician, and it's, they're telling them, well, you know, your, your, your meds are getting harder to manage. You probably would be a good DBS candidate. Why don't we start looking at that now? Let's just talk about it, learn about it. And for uh, some patients, they're not interested. For, for again, very reasonable uh, uh, reasons, not, not wanting to consider it. But um, the problem is that if they later uh, decide they want deep brain stimulation and have waited a long, long time, uh, and, and they still have some symptoms that some of the symptoms may respond, but they have a lot of other serious issues that are not going to respond to the simulation. So, for example, if when the meds are taken, uh, they approve, but they can't walk, um, BBS is going to allow them to walk. Um, if uh, they take the medication, the lupidopa, and, and they get better, but not dramatically better, not minimally better, enough that they would want to take the medicine, BBS isn't going to make them any better than lupidopa. And uh, a big one is if uh, they develop significant thinking difficulties, cognitive difficulties, dementia, hallucinations, things like that, and confusion. Uh, DBS uh, can actually make that worse. So you don't want to implant a lead in the brain in people that have serious cognitive issues with Parkinson's. It's, it's not indicated. It's a big, a big, a big uh, thing that we work very hard to avoid. Uh, so some benefits of deep brain stimulation, uh, the tremor again progresses with age or change in health status, so the DBS can be adjusted. Uh, the DBS is very, uh, uh, it's neuromodulation, which means to be changed, modulated. The energy level, charge size, the frequency, the area of the brain stimulated are all changeable. But to contrast this with uh, lesioning procedures, which are thalamotomy, gamma knife, ultrasound, they're all essentially the same type of procedure in that they irreversibly burn brain tissue. They do it in different ways. Telemodin is electrical, gamma knives with radiation, ultrasounds with sound waves. Ultrasound, of course, has become very popular lately for essential tremor, although it's yet to really establish itself in a meaningful way of Parkinson's disease. Um, so uh, the problem with these lesion surgeries is the tremor may break through. And if that's the case, and there's been a lesioning procedure already, it's, it's it's possible, but not really recommended to do DBS in that situation. Um, now, fortunately, uh, these uh, lesion procedures are pretty good. I mean, they, when they, they, they're pretty darn good at, at lesioning the brain and improving the tremor dramatically, but uh, the tremor can break through. I've, I've seen it, many of us have seen it a number of times. The other big problem is only one side of the brain should be treated. No, and, and no, and no, under no circumstance should uh, both sides of the brain be treated with either any of these ultrasound gamma knife uh, because we we you know we see that people that have damage to both sides of the brain you know problems with swallowing balance speech this is all permanent if, if the thalamus is damaged it's hard to 
And the other big problem is, uh, is so far, uh, we've not been able to use these lesioning surgeries to, to treat the other symptoms of Parkinson's that are, in, in many cases, more problematic, which is slowness and stiffness. So you're not getting off meds really at all, or, or likely to reduce medication uh, with many of these uh, surgeries. Um, uh, the way I do think that uh, that these procedures can be useful. I, I do recommend them for certain types of patients. That typically, in my practice, patients that are near the end of life or palliative care may not, uh, you know, really be able to go through a deep brain stimulation procedure, which isn't that taxing, but you know, it is a neurosurgical procedure. Um, you know, I, I do recommend these, and they, they do have their place, but I think that it's important to understand where they fit. All right, what does the science show? Well, again, we spoke earlier about uh, the benefits of DBS with medication, and, that, and that's the idea. The idea is not to get you off medicine completely, and certainly, though, not to make you reliant, it's to make you less reliant on medication, absolutely. Less reliant on medication is one of the major goals of DBS. And we find that DBS is electrical treatment, medicine is a chemical treatment, and they work better together than either do by themselves. And it gives you more good years. So you may uh, see better improvements earlier uh, rather than waiting an excessive long period of time. Uh, DBS is really very safe. Um, you know, I'm, I know all the programs we're in our, well in our Northwest area, and we're, we're fortunate that, you know, whether in Seattle, Portland, uh, in the Northwest here in Spokane, uh, we have really ex excellent uh, track record of, of uh, surgical uh, results um, for patients. So the risk of infection and severe disability is very low. And that stroke and death risk is extremely low. You know, it's always possible like, with any medical procedure, but uh, quite, quite low. Ability to adjust DBS is a, a clear advantage. Uh, again, burning a hole in the brain, like we talked earlier, versus neuromodulation is a big thing. Uh, we, we already kind of um, uh, talked about the pros and cons of this, so I'm going to move on to, to targeting the location. Uh, this is a slice through the brain in the middle of it. Uh, if you're looking at someone's face, kind of right in the middle of their head. Uh, and uh, here in the middle, uh, we see different sections. There's the subthalamic nucleus here, the STN. Uh, that's a major target for Parkinson's disease, um, an area where the, the lead is targeted to. Also, the globus pallidus here, the GPI is globus pallidus. Turnout, this is another target. So again, based on how you respond to medication, it's very, very informative to your doctors where to place the lead. You have to pick one, one area the STN or the GPI. Uh, historically, we, we were doing uh, the GPI way a long time ago for neurosurgical procedures. And then we really started doing the subthalamic nucleus uh, more so uh, for many, many years. But uh, the, the trend has switched back to doing GPI more for people that have a lot of dyskinesia, um, um, uh, high sensitivity to medicine. So low dose of medicine makes me very, very dyskinetic. Um, and uh, the STN at time is more for people where or they're tremor dominant Parkinson's, or they take a very large medicine dose, or they have a lot of off time that's very severe in between the doses. Um, those are just general rules of thumb. Uh, the, the decision uh, on which area to target in the brain is really between the, the patient and their uh, doctor and neurosurgeon. But, but just to give you an idea about the type of things we think about when we're trying to select targets. And also it, it should hopefully show you why it's important to, to have thorough trials of medicine because the trial of medicine is very informative to your treatment team. You know, which kind of patient like, like this you will be. All right, now for the new stuff. So this is uh, kind of some updates on directional steering, new rechargeable batteries and battery upgrades on old leads, uh, DBS sensing, uh, closed loop technology, and DBS program assistance with visual guidance. Uh, directional steering. So this is kind of the, the main big, big development over the last five years or so is uh, this idea of, uh, is similar to the current DBS lead, uh, but the, the former DBS lead, uh, which you know many people before I don't know, 2020, let's say, have had implanted. Uh, 
their simulation around the lead in an even sphere, the size of the simulated area is determined by how much energy we put into the into the, 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 the lead, which basically results in current flowing out of the contact. And how long and frequently the simulation occurred determined by the pulse width and frequency. That's the, the pulse width and frequency DBS settings. This is made possible by a DBS lead that's what they call fragmented contacts and points stimulating the current in specific directions based on which leads are activated. So why? Why do we need this? Well, the idea is to, to do what DBS already does, but do it better. So more you get good benefits from DBS, an easier way to get away from side effects that may be related to stimulation. Here's a, a picture of, uh, these are actually both new leads, but the one on top is an unfragmented lead, kind of a standard one where it stimulates uh, around uh, the lead in a complete circle, like a donut. Uh, the one below that, you can see the break in the contacts here. And so these are, we'll see it in a different view in a minute. These are uh, three fragmented contacts on the middle two, two sections. <clears throat> and this allows us to, to steer uh, the current in one direction and not in another. So uh, it gives us more precision, more focus. Uh, this is a, actually a picture of a fragmented contact, so one of the newer ones, but it's, it's when it's used like the old leads were used. This is kind of what it looks like a donut, okay, when it's used the, the traditional way of uh, uh, circumferential uh, stimulation, where it's stimulating evenly all around the, the contact. And in this case, it's well placed uh, in, in a, a nucleus and uh, looks good, but that's, but that's the picture of, of kind of what we were able to do before directional stimulation. Rechargeable batteries, uh, they happen to be very, very small. Uh, they're, they're extremely thin, uh, smallest batteries that there have ever been out for DBS. And you don't have to have a surgery again to replace a rechargeable for at least 15 years, perhaps even longer, but at least 15 years. And um, they're warranty for that, in fact. Uh, the recharging frequency is about um, every uh, two weeks, maybe every one week, and, and you actually wear uh, the device that recharges, uh, so you can do things around the house, you're not plugged into the wall like a you know, air conditioner or something like that. Uh, so, so you can you can move around uh, while it's doing that. Gives some. And then uh, many people that are reading about DBS, I didn't hear this early on, but, but should know that. Uh, these DBS devices, by, by and large, uh, the, the newer ones particularly are uh, conditionally MRI compatible, which means you can, in most you know, reasonably sized area, medical cell areas, there's gonna be a, a place where they're uh, able to do an MRI if there's an emergency uh, and, and, and turn the DBS off and there's no problem with that. Now, one of the neat little uh, kind of engineering feats is, uh, uh, you know, the, they're considering kind of the, the, the larger group of people with Parkinson's, not just simply people that, that, that are going to be getting DBS implantation, but also people that have had DBS for many years. And so, you know, is, is it possible for them to take advantage of some of the newer technology? And the answer is yes. Um, this is an example of, of the, you know, the old Medtronic battery, which is, there's a lot of these around Exactiva PCs that can be converted to the Boston Scientific battery to use with Medtronic leads. And you can do a vertical steering when it's time for battery replacement. It's just a simple swap out. So you go from battery replacements every three to four years, not having any directional steering in a larger battery to much smaller battery, a battery that lasts 15 years, you can recharge uh, every so often. Um, smaller and gives you some directional uh, programming capacity, not the full capacity we see with the, the, the new uh, Boston Scientific Leagues, but some capacity to adjust the battery. So this is really something to think about when it's time to get an EBS uh, battery uh, replacement. It's you know, good to have hard choices, I think, it means that there are options out there. So uh, just be informed that, that there's uh, a lot more things to talk about than simply it's time to replace the battery. Now we're moving on to a different topic. This is called DBS sensing technology. What is it sensing? Well, Previously, DBS programming required someone to look at tremor, feeling, stiffness of the limbs, and watch it for slow movement. That's me, or your uh, clinician programmer. 
Well, also there are electrical signals deep in the brain that go along with Parkinson's disease symptoms. This is fast for frequency signals that are firing between eight to 20 times a second, eight to 20 hertz, uh, deep within the brain. It's called the beta band. It's abnormal, it's seen in Parkinson's. So not only are you abnormal visually, in the sense of slowness and stiffness of tremor, but the brain is abnormal electrically with this beta band. It goes along with the, the visual um, symptoms as well. So we've learned to record the signals with the implanted EBS signal. It's already there. And uh, this is a, a very, uh, uh, you know, science heavy slide, but, but I think it's still worth looking at. I want to walk you through it real quick. Now, the bottom line is that this beta burst here, uh, this is a beta. Okay, this is frequency. It's all you have to know. It's a frequency of firing of cells. They're firing here normally. In Parkinson's disease, uh, this firing becomes abnormal because it gets larger. And then in moderate Parkinson's, it gets even larger. And the idea is this is a, in an area of the brain that's right by where the EBS lead is. So the EBS lead normally sends a signal, but guess what? It can also be set up to listen to the signal. And that's, that's the idea here is to be able to listen to this signal and, and, and sense that this moderate Parkinson's, the higher signal of the beta band, is different than normal. So we have something else to look at and a set of tremor and slowness and stiffness that, that we can hopefully have the DBS lead sense when this abnormal signal is coming out. You know, that's, that's a good thing. And uh, this is uh, the overlap uh, here showing just different sites, how with mild to more moderate Parkinson's you have more elevated beta bands. So kind of a really, really neat development. Uh, uh, doctors have been working at the heart of this for a long, long time, Helen Bronte Stewart. And, and others uh, looking at, um, at this uh, biomarker. Um, and so wouldn't it be useful to record electrical activity that goes along with Parkinson's symptoms and use the DBS device to record it so we could treat the electrical abnormality in addition to what we see? And this would make DBS more precise. Uh, this is called the, that, that kind of the beta band, that kind of electrical stimulation we're seeing, that's called a local field potential or an LFP. And, and you'll see this if you look online on the marketing material, they, they kind of have some stuff about this. Uh, but basically it reflects Parkinson's and it correlates with works on Parkinson's. And guess what? Levodopa, when it's taken, reduces the beta band. So we see when we're chemically treated Parkinson's, that electrical abnormality starts to normalize as well. So everything just kind of comes together. Uh, so this is actually technology that is already available on the Medtronic preset generator. Um, and it's recorded off of current or new DBS leads. Um, so the idea is the neurologist would uh, set the device up to gather data before visit and come in and look at the data and then uh, you know adjust the programming based on if the DBS is, is telling the clinician, you know, are we having a normal signal with this therapy or is the signal abnormal? You know, and and, and that that would give them some more clues that adjustments need to be made. But a big problem with this hasn't been quite tested yet. So this is science uh, that exists without uh, us completely under, well understanding how to use it, which is okay. But uh, we obviously need to, to look a lot more at, at how do we you know, fit this in? How, how is this done in a way that's complementary to, uh, to what we already know? I mean, we don't want to reinvent the will. We want everything to kind of be additive and the fine tuning the precision of DBS. And hopefully that will, will get us further in there. This is another topic. Uh, it, it's a bit, uh, a bit going off the last topic. It's open loop DBS. Uh, open loop, what is open loop and closed loop? Um, well, I'm going to explain it. Uh, open loop DBS does not use a sensor for recording the brain condition. For example, all of you now that have DBS have open loop DBS. So the clinician sees you, they program the DBS. That's an open loop. There, there's nothing, nothing, nothing going back after they do that. It's just kind of a, a direction. They program you. The brain doesn't send any signal back. Okay. So the problem with that is that currently the, that kind of DBS programming, the results are very dependent on the skill and training of the programmer. And you know, the, there's been a lot of attempts made to, to train as many people as possible, but, but DBS is challenging. And, and, and the reason DBS is challenging is you actually have to know a heck of a lot about Parkinson's disease. So simply knowing how to, to push the buttons on a DBS programmer is probably the easiest part. Uh, but but the, the harder part is actually spending years and years and years learning about Parkinson's and the meds and the disease, and understanding what's what. 
So it, it's it's a big problem. You know, there's just not enough Parkinson specialists out there, doctors, nurse practitioners. So so, anyways, uh, the idea of, of having some additional tools to make it uh, easier to program BBS well it is a is a, um, a real need. What is closed loop? Well, closed loop DBS employs a sensor, a sensor of some type to record a signal link to the symptoms. Um, and this could be a could be wrist worn tremor monitor, it could be a movement speed sensor, or it could be a local film potential beta band. Kind of get where we're going here. So uh, the idea is a closed loop DBS would adjust itself immediately based on feedback from sensors. It could be any sensor, it could be many sensors together, but but certainly where this is headed, this adaptive DBS is uh, is measuring. So again, on the left, the open loop DBS is uh, looking at uh, the, the, the clinical symptoms here, the tremor, for example. Uh, we set the stimulator, it, it does, does what it does to the brain. That's what you got. Closed loop DBS, it would be the same thing. We set it based on what we see. And then based on that setting, uh, it's gonna record activity in the brain, these local field potentials. And uh, it's gonna uh, relay that back to the stimulator and adjust the stimulator. We can also adjust it clinically, of course, based on Kind of symptoms we're seeing, but but we're having another tool, not only looking at the patient's body, the exam, looking at the electrophysiology, electrical firing, the brain. So really quite quite powerful possibility here, uh, but but a lot a lot to be worked out. And how is this going to happen? Well, this is a, a, a study called uh, Adapt PD, which is looking at closed loop, or they call it an adaptive DDS. Uh, algorithm for personalized therapy in Parkinson's. It's got 12 uh, large sites and none in the Northwest, if you should wondering. Uh, 12 sites looking uh, at 36 subjects uh, that are un un undergo a total evaluation period of 15 months. And they've already enrolled uh, this completely. They're following them now. Uh, they're comparing standard uh, continuous DBS, which is open loop, to adaptive DBS, which is closed loop, for hours of on time without troublesome dyskinesia. Then uh, what happens is they're all getting the standard standard DBS at baseline, the randomizer, let me get here, this adaptive closed loop or the open loop. I'm trying to see what their on time slide is. So it's, it is being tested. Our last piece here is DBS programming with visual assistance. So uh, DBS programming platforms uh, are available with uh, new uh, pulse generators that, that allow visualization, it lets us see. So, uh, you know, I kind of like where this is all headed, where we have our exam we can look at. Uh, we're potentially looking at electrical patterns, and we're also looking at the brain anatomy. And that's, that's crucial. And this is, after all, a neurosurgical procedure where wires are, are placed um, in the right spot. <laughs> that's the big, the big point. And uh, we want to put the electrical stimulation in the right spot. So, so that's, that's uh, uh, historically the only way we've been able to do that is by looking at the patient and program them and their symptoms improve and look basically normal, we make an assumption that we're programming it in the right spot, but you can't see it. So, so this is uh, trying to get us to that point. So it enables us to see precisely a shape and steer the DBS therapy. Uh, importantly for the clinicians, this is integrates into the program experience. So it's kind of just designed to be user-friendly. It's three-dimensional, uh, always neat because you can also show it. Show this as well. And so this is looking at uh, the STEM UXT. We were at our site uh, uh, in the Northwest Research Center in Spokane. We're actually the largest enrolling site for this, uh, the program for the research for this called Guide XT, where um, uh, DBS is done per routine uh, methods. Uh, but we have this unique programming system that will allow us to basically uh, program what we see. And what we see this time not being the tremor uh, slowness, but being the brain itself and the targets that we intend to stimulate. Uh, so uh, we have some data that's been released and uh, published uh, uh, in poster form and some conferences, and we'll have more to come on that. But uh, this is something that is uh, released, and we get the idea here. There's just a lot, a lot of stuff going on in the DBS world. It's uh, a lot to keep up with as doctors and, and providers. And, and that's, that's fantastic. It's fantastic for, for patients. Um, it's fantastic that, um, you know, and, and what I would tell you is that really, uh, you know, a well done DBS procedure, you really, you really don't need a lot of this stuff. That's the important thing to remember.
well done DBS procedure in the, in the proper patient at the right time. Um, many of the things that I'm showing you here are just kind of exciting bells and whistles. And, and the fundamentals of, of the program uh, here, which we were talking about in the beginning sections, are really the stuff to, to, to focus on. Uh, getting the right uh, patient at the right time, um, having an experienced site, uh, select the patient is very important. Have, have, uh, how the patient is selected for DBS is easily as important as who does the DBS with the neurosurgeon. So if you don't have the right patient, the best surgeon in the world is not going to be able to help them. Um, so, uh, but again, these are all very exciting things, which uh, we're, we're hoping that as people live longer and longer with DBS, then, then some of these bells and whistles are going to come into play more uh, to, to make the overall experience of living with Parkinson's disease easier. Well, I would I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting me uh, here uh, to the, the uh, WPF. And so this is uh, just a little bit of my uh, uh, background here, Silkert Neurology or we could practice here. If there's any uh, uh, questions, you can contact me at info at silkertneurology.com. And if you would like to see uh, or read about any of our uh, very exciting, uh, uh, really uh, fantastic cutting edge cutting clinical trials, you can look at uh, inlandnorthwestresearch.com uh, or contact at kindofresearch.com. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and I uh, hope you enjoy the presentation.